Uh, Jay Gilbertson is the longtime manager of East Dakota Water Development District, a subunit of the South Dakota State Government that deals with a wide range of water resource issues. Current district activities include basin-wide surface water sampling, groundwater protection, policy development, environmental outreach, and watershed restoration. Jay has an undergraduate and graduate degrees in geology, and in a prior life worked for a South Dakota Geological Survey. All right, let's see if we can make this work. Okay, so where's the water, you know, when demand exceeds availability? Um, just to kind of rush through quickly here, I've got a, uh, Tori and I are going to kind of tag team. I'm going to do my little shtick and then end up with a lead-in slide for him, and then he's going to get up and probably refute everything I say. Uh, but that's okay. Um, talk a little bit about what we have, what we know we have, where the resources are, what they're like. Um, how they're being used and what the demand is, is going on, and then talk a little bit about potential future sources, um, wrapping up with, you know, the big reveal at the end is it's probably going to be a big pipe, not to get out in front of myself. Um, so in terms of resources in South Dakota as far as water goes, um, depending on the time of year, you know, we've got water in a lot of places all over the state, there are very few instances where, at least in theory, that you could not drill a hole and find something down below that is wet. But in many instances, and the greatest example I think we've got is, or a great example many of you are probably aware of, is the Flaming Fountain in Pier. Okay? How many people have seen the Flaming Fountain? It hasn't flamed for a while, but that's water, and there's a lot of it coming out of the ground, and it burns. Okay, probably not a great resource. Um, so anyway, we have water resources available around the state. Um, from a surface water standpoint, we've sort of got two big areas where there is a lot of it, sometimes maybe even too much. First and foremost, of course, is the Missouri River running down through the middle of the state, a very large body of water by any uh, scale that you would consider. Uh, and it's a resource that can be tapped and is being tapped right now. Um, beyond that, our major surface water sources are kind of few and far between. We have things out here that are called rivers, having grown up in Minnesota, northern Wisconsin. Big creeks, tops, but there you go. It's some resource. There are some large bodies up in the northeastern part of the state, Bitter Lake, Lake Thompson, Ponset, Campesca. Uh, that could provide a fair amount of surface water, but for the most part, surface water isn't always a wonderful resource for us. It's pretty, it, it, it's stuck in a few small locations. Um, and as evidence of that uh, would point to uh, several systems already in place, uh, web water up in the north, uh, mid-Dakota and Minnewachone on the central part of the state, Randall uh, down near uh, the Fort Randall Dam, and then technically even the Lewis and Clark system down by Vermilion, they're all taking water from the river and moving it to where it's needed. They're doing that because there isn't enough where they're sending it. And certainly one of our good examples around here is the city. Uh, I didn't have the Big Sioux River highlighted on that last slide, but uh, the city does make use of it, has historically. Um, pulled a fair amount of water out of the river, probably, presumably was the original resource uh, for the community. As the community grew, they started to tap into groundwater sources and so forth, but uh, it continues to remain uh, to be a, an important resource for the city. And if you listen to any of the water quality talks earlier today, something that we need to do a better job of protecting that resource. Um, quick aside, I promised Travis I would mention this. I'm the promoter. Uh, one more reason we need to protect the Big Sioux River is it's, again, where the water comes from, and you can make beer from it. Uh, and the uh, uh, upper left-hand corner shot there is a, a truck and a pump and water being pulled out of the river. Central image is what it looks like before it's been treated. Uh, it's filtered uh, substantially and ultimately courtesy of, of uh, some cooperators with Remedy and, and uh, Wood grain brewing has been turned into beer over the last couple of years uh, in an effort to raise the profile or uh, the importance of, of uh, why we need to take care of our surface water. I would note that the first three versions, the three big cans, El Rio and the two Big Sioux brews, were intentionally made into very light, clear beers. 
because if you tell someone you're making beer out of the Big Sioux River, they would immediately expect perhaps a stout or something exceedingly, you know, opaque. Uh, flow riding, by the time we got to that, that was the last one, that was actually a pretty hazy IPA, very good. Uh, but much like the Big Sioux River, very difficult to see through, but much easier to drink. So anyway, the river's important. Our other uh, major resource, and really the, the primary resource for most of the water supplies here in the eastern side of South Dakota uh, are uh, groundwater resources, aquifers. Uh, these largely reside uh, east of the river, and uh, if you're looking at the map, you'll hopefully notice that the topography east and west of the, uh, the Missouri River looks a little bit different. Um, anybody tell me why? Mr. Common has to keep his hand down. No. <laughs> okay. Well, the reason why is that uh, the river marks the, basically the east or the western extent of glacial activity, last time the glaciers were down here. They came in from the north and they turned everything on the eastern side into sort of a north-south deal, where on the west we have old bedrock. From a groundwater standpoint, what that means is if you are west of the Missouri River, it's really easy to figure out where the water is. You figure out where you are in the stratigraphic pile, you identify which layer has the water you want, your elevation, its elevation, you drill a hole that deep and bang, it's there. And every, for the most part, very simplified version, but the rocks are all in big layers. And so again, if you know your elevation and you know your target, it's relatively simple to find. Um, and again, there's the picture of the cute little layered rocks and then a, a shot, admittedly dated, of the old flaming fountain coming out of one of those layered rocks that also had other stuff in it. So presumably not a great resource for water. Having worked at the Geological Survey, I have to include at least two or three geologic maps in any presentation I give. Um, so our state map, and again, based on the color scheme, hopefully you can make out there's a big difference east and west of the Missouri River. Uh, the browns and oranges are the glacial sediments, and the greens and the blues and everything else in the west are the layered or crystalline rocks. Um, the difference on the eastern side is that uh, very few of those units are flat and aerially extensive. They're a hodgepodge of a whole bunch of different things that don't follow rhyme nor reason unless you've spent a lot of time looking at them, and even then it's mostly a big guess. The upside of the big guess is it provides employment for people like Tim and myself for a long period of time while you try and figure out uh, what's going on, whereas over on the western side, a couple of weeks and a few holes and you're done. Um, over on the eastern side, our primary resource are what are called glacial outwash aquifers. These are basically, as shown in that, uh, I guess, the right-hand image, uh, sands and gravel deposits that were de uh, left behind by streams carrying meltwater off the front of the ice. They'd pick up whatever sediment was available, carry it as far as it could, and then dump it off. And the coarse sediment tended to stay behind, and the fines were carried away. And what you end up with is that gravel in the couple of two pictures. Note Sue there, who is rocking a mullet. Uh, this is a very old picture. Um, and the water that we, we use is found in between the grains in these deposits. Now, because they are formed in little valleys and not giant sheets, it takes a lot of work to find them. And so Tim and his crew and former colleagues of mine uh, spend an awful lot of time poking holes all over South Dakota, looking to find these buried resources, particularly on the eastern side of the state. This is a somewhat dated map. Um, but each of the little green dots represents a hole drilled by the state looking to identify these resources. For the most part, these aren't private wells. Um, these are wells drilled specifically to identify the available, or the, the geology that was present. Uh, if you're, I guess, you, hopefully you can maybe see it. You'll probably notice there's a grid system to it. You know, east and west, north and south lines, you just go out there and start poking holes and go another mile and poke another hole and go another mile and poke another hole just to see what's down there. And because of that database, we do have a tremendous, we know a tremendous amount about what is below land surface, um, which is great because, again, it doesn't behave. Uh, you'll probably, maybe the, a few acute eyes will pick out that Buffalo and Brule County have not had a lot of work done in them yet. 
We're still waiting. Uh, Sully and Potter also pretty quiet, but for the most part, the rest of the eastern part of the state's been done. Um, and as a result, uh, the survey and cooperating agencies have been able to develop maps that tell us where aquifer materials can be found. Uh, this is the aquifer material. First occurrence, what's called the first occurrence of aquifer materials map uh, for Minnehaha County. Um, the orange and yellow uh, colors on the map represent the surficial aquifers, the sands and gravels of what we would call the Big Sioux aquifer running down the uh, central portion, hooking a little, doing the little dipsy do down there in the end and heading on down to Sioux City. Um, on the western side are uh, parts of the aquifer that are affiliated with the, the Skunk Creek and the various tributaries to the Skunk. Uh, these are the primary resources or have been the primary resources for groundwater in this region for quite a long time. This is where all the city's wells are located. They're in the Big Sioux or the Skunk Creek uh, surface sands and gravels. The, gray, uh, the grays on this map are uh, aquifer units that are buried at depth. This is a, not a particularly colorful map in this regard. Uh, there's really only the, the, the big gray units here or what we would call the Split Rock Creek up in the northwest and the, uh, uh, through the central lake. It's probably the Wall Lake down in the lower part. These are buried units, um, don't have surface exposure, uh, but they've been identified to, through drilling. And we can make out, at least on a few of these, some of the wall lake, there are some of these little black dots. The black dots are places where holes have been drilled. And having drilled some, at least not too many of these holes, but some of the others, uh, I will tell you that often as not, we tend to get a little generous with our estimations of where things are. You drill a hole one mile, and you, or you drill a hole here, you go a mile over, you hit something at about the same level, it's really tempting to connect the two. It's really, really, really tempting. It's not always the best idea. So the more you drill, the less you find in terms of aerial extent. But it's important because this is where our water is coming from. And so we've got surface water, we've got groundwater, um, resources that are out there and available. Um, that's what we have. How are we using it? Well, or how have we used the water, past tense or current tense, depending on where you're at? Well, for a lot of different reasons. You know, small communities, we're using it for homes. Maybe you're on a municipal system. Maybe you're on a rural water system. Maybe you've got your own well. Uh, certainly agriculture at various scales. Uh, irrigation, whether it's for an individual lawn or uh, you know, a field of corn or beans or whatever. I'm a geologist. I don't know. They're green. Uh, they're not dead and they're not fossils, and I don't care. Um, and then... Uh, you know, various sources. We've, we've used a lot of water in the past, but nothing compared to what's coming. Uh, in places where even the limited, uh, the resources that we had for the limited demand we had uh, in place um, could not be met, we had the development of South Dakota's rural water systems. These are the example for those of you who live in town. It's basically, it's the city public water works only out in the country. Uh, a good source is identified at one or more locations, um, a well field is established, treatment plants are built, and then lines are run. Only instead of, you know, the lines running from house to house to house to house to house along a block, they may go from farm to farm to farm, and those farms may be miles apart in some instances, and they cover substantial areas. Again, was there water over most of these areas prior to this? Yeah. There was apparently enough to get somebody to live there, but given a choice between surviving on what they had and having somebody else bring them good water, pretty much everybody said, we'll take that. And so over again, much of eastern South Dakota, you can see we've got regional water systems and a good part of the west as well has been fed by those. Some are pulling from the river, others are pulling, many are pulling from shallow uh, glacial aquifers in the region. And that is, for the most part, feeding our system up to this point. The Lewis and Clark system, just make out in here, is the area with the little uh, hatchers that extends uh, off into both Minnesota, southwest Minnesota, and northwest Iowa. Uh, they, too, are missing water. In fact, it's a lot harder to find in southwest Minnesota than it is in eastern South Dakota. 
So an opportunity to, uh, to get that water was, was jumped on when that, that became available. But where are we headed? How are we going to use the water? Well, we continue to have small uses and demands, but we're starting to see some really big changes. You know, serious development. Sioux Falls is a wonderful, op wonderful example of that. Um, you know, we don't have a couple of houses being built. We have three and four and 500 home developments going up all over the place. Um, happened to include in here. My apologies for those who are, you know, if that's a problem. But anyway, something like the proposed Holstone facility. They are not going to use a little bit of water. They are going to use a lot. They are going to use probably more than the city of Brookings on a daily basis. That's a substantial amount. Um, we don't have small farms. We have giant um, animal feeding operations or dairies. It's not good nor bad. That's just the reality of right now. You know, 10,000 dairy cows drink a lot of water. And they're all, when they're all in one spot, we need to find a way to, to service them. And then secondary processing like ethanol plants and so forth all have tremendous water demands, the likes of which most of our available systems simply do not have the capacity to provide. Or if they do, you will do that at the expense of some other development that you might want to have. Um, there's Scott over there. Um, I'm trying to think when I, when I heard, first heard this, but uh, Scott Buss with the Minneapolis Community Water, we were having this conversation at one point, and he mentioned that um, a million gallons a day, which is a number you will commonly hear kind of tossed about in terms of water, you know, water needs or development and so forth, a million gallons a day is the equivalent of, there will, will provide water for the equivalent of about 4,300 homes. 10, 12, 15,000 people. That is not an uncommon ask for large uh, ag processing or other manufacturing developments to bring to a water system. We need a million gallons a day. Well, if you've got a million, and you give it to them, that's great. If you're a small community thinking, well, this would be fantastic development, wouldn't it? Boy, we can bring in, we got, you know, how many hundreds or thousands of jobs, only now all of a sudden everybody has to live in the next town over because you've given away all the water. You know, the new, op the new operator is now using all the water that would have fed the homes that you can't build in town because you don't have water at that scale. So all of these things are coming into play. With the grow shot, this, this slide actually did not turn out the way I thought it was going to. I was hoping for a much more dramatic increase. Uh, the mayor and, and Mr. Cotter need to get on it here. Um, this, is a, uh, this chart shows, well, a couple of things. The, the uh, yellow line across the top is the water consumption, I think it's annual water consumption in now I can't, I've heard of it here. Probably billion gallons, in billions of gallons for the city of Sioux Falls. And over the last 20 plus years, that's wavered between six and eight million, or six, yeah, six or eight billion gallons. And actually that last dot is good only through, I think, the end of September, so that one's gonna be a little higher up in there. But, you know, water demand, water use, you know, a low of six-ish up to eights and then back, kind of wandering back and forth. It's remained fairly static, which surprises me and I think is probably a function of some of the climatic forcing things in there. The lower lines represent where that water has come from. Um, the blue line here is groundwater resources. The red line is surface water. And until 2012, the magic year, uh, that was the city's two choices. So with 100% of their water, it's either, you know, if 60% is coming from the ground, 40% comes from the river. That continued on that way. Um, something interesting must have been going on in this low water year uh, until about 2012, at which point this solid gray line, that is when Lewis and Clark became an option for the city. 
Okay. And as you can see pretty quickly, one, Lewis and Clark started feeding the city at a substantial level, you know, quickly jumped up to about 50% of their, their annual use. Uh, and the river dropped off equally dramatically. And the simple reason there is that it was cheaper to buy water from Troy than it was to make it out of the river water. Okay? And so that, that system shut down for a while. But I would note down here at the end, the, the river's back in play, which suggests that the, the demand is such that we need some additional water in that resource. We're going to need to find more water. Sioux Falls is not getting smaller. The ground can only provide so much, the river can only provide so much, and pipe, Troy's pipes are only so big. And so we'll need to be looking for more. So what about future sources? Outside of the room, most people probably think if we need more water, we just need to open the tap more. That's how it works at my house, you know. Make it go faster, Grandpa, turn the valve. Uh, that's not really it, obviously, I'm not, telling anybody here this, but I, you know, have to go through the talk. Um, our resources are finite, particularly in a given area. Uh, if we are not where the water is, the water has, we either move, you know, you, Muhammad goes to the mountain or we figure out a way to move the mountain to Muhammad. Um, and where there are existing systems. We go back to, the, or well, think back to that big map of all the rural water systems. People look at that and go, oh, well, there's a rural water system everywhere. As long as I'm not in the white area, there's as much water as I need. And it's like, no, no. Some of those areas that are colored, the pipe that covers them is this big around. And if you need this much water, that's a problem. And, well, I've got an example later on about where you can get in trouble with that. Uh, and then finally, it takes time to develop new resources. If there's groundwater available and you can drill a well and put a well field in and so forth, maybe two, three, four, five years, knock on wood, right Scott, about four years. Uh, if there's surface water available, maybe even quicker, but that's become a little tough, particularly when it's dry. Uh, if you need to run a pipe from somewhere, that is a much longer proposition. So what can we do in the short term? This is where I, we tie in the sustainability part of things. We have to take care of what we have. Uh, protect what we currently have. Uh, many of the counties up and down the Big Sioux River Basin uh, several decades ago, frankly, instituted a series of uh, ordinances largely at the county level for zoning, although the city of Sioux Falls also has one of these in place, that identifies the areas uh, the part of the aquifer that they're using and puts in place restrictions on land use for those areas. You know, if it was a pre-existing deal, you're fine. But if you want to move in and say, hey, I'd really like to site this chemical storage facility on top of the aquifer, they're going to say no, which is very understandable. And these have, for the most part, been extremely successful. I can think of one instance uh, in my 30 plus years of working with these, and in many instances, um, back in the day, I was the one that actually drew the lines on most of these maps. Uh, I can think of only one time when we had a real conflict at the local level, where the, they really, really, really wanted to put something at a spot where it didn't belong. And that lasted only until the lawyers got involved and it was over in a heartbeat. Um, you look at that up, well, look at the next map here. This is a chunk of, of the aquifer map from Dual County up to the north. Um, the areas that are shaded in yellow or green are the sh shallow superficial aquifer. You can see there's an awful lot of white. That's the part where there's no aquifer and there's nothing bad. If you can dump on the ground whatever you want to, no, don't do that, but you know, you get the point. Um, there's nothing under you that's going to be contaminated. So there's an awful lot of space. So if you want to put in something that's going to be a problem and your initial choice is to go here over the shallow aquifer, no, pack up and go over here and everything's going to be fine. Um, don't do it here, do it over there. Directing development to a certain extent, but certainly recognizing that your shallow or your groundwater resources need to be protected and then protect them. 
you know, no matter what the cost, well, I would say no matter what the cost, but, you know, uh, I, it, I'm hard pressed to imagine any sort of, of development that could uh, replace an aquifer. And in this particular instance, um, this, the little green shaded areas are what we call zone A's. Those are the actual portions that are currently being used. Uh, this one is for the city of Clear Lake. That actually has been discontinued. They've discontinued use, and basically, if you are a resident of Dual County, South Dakota, you do not, and you do not have your own well, that is where your water comes from. That's the only public water source in all of Dual County. So it's kind of important we protect it. On the plus side, it's real easy to protect, and then you can do pretty much whatever you want anywhere else. But we need to we need to protect things. Um, that was my what I should have done before I just made that little comment. Uh, anyway, um, defining the resource that we have. Mentioned earlier, alluded earlier to the fact that the more, the more we drill, the more we find we were probably a little optimistic about what was out there. Uh, another example, how many geologists does it take to drill a hole? The answer is all of them, pretty much. In defense of Tim's people, at the time we had a pretty good sized crew working the rig that was there. I had another crew. We were on a downtime. We went over to visit, and there were a few other people there. But I think we had about 60% of the state survey in a road ditch south of Millbank when that shot was taken. But you drill more holes. And uh, a little more colorful map. This is Grant County up in the northeast. Um, and again, each of the colors represents different aquifers that are available uh, depending on the depth you want to go and so forth. But, uh, doing a better job of defining that resource is important, whether it's looking at where is the material itself at depth, or perhaps considering how much is really there. And for this, I'll kind of kick up more to surface water than anything else. Um, from a standpoint, I, I suspect most everyone will recognize the, uh, the thing on the right as the Hoover Dam. Uh, that picture is about three years old at this point, so I think there's a whole lot more white available here. But understanding what's, what's truly available. When the Colorado River was divvied up back in the 20s, it was with a very short period of record and a whole lot of wet years, and everybody thought they had tons and tons of water to use. Reality has proven to be something different, and they're now operating at a deficit, and Certain elements are concerned that the Missouri River might look like a really attractive option. And you can imagine what it costs to run a pipe from the Missouri up to Sioux Falls. What would it cost to run a pipe from the Missouri to Phoenix? But if you need the water, who knows? So anyway, we need to do a good job. We, we've got gauging stations uh, that are operated by the Federal Survey. We've got flow measurements being taken, all in an effort to get a better handle. Uh, this chart in the upper uh, left-hand corner uh, is a, uh, I think it's about a year, well, multi-year track. I can't read it from here. I'm getting old and it all works out. Well, anyway, let's just say the, the blue line represents current conditions or at the time the chart was made, the uh, orange line is sort of long-term running averages. And with the Colorado, the problem they had is they were actually maybe looking at uh, data that was more along the blue line when things were really wet, when they should have had a better data set and they'd have realized that on normal circumstances a lot of this wasn't going to be available. We can do the same thing. Better to find the resources that we do have because we're going to have to make use of those. Um, in, that includes as well working on water quality. The more we know, the better off we're going to be. Now, a lot of these are sort of voluntary activities. Um, we do have a couple, well, this is one of our, you know, one of our samplers, actually a couple of our samplers doing things out here, but knowing more about the resource helps for water quality as well. If it's in good shape, we need to keep it that way. If it's in bad, we need to do things to make it better. Uh, groundwater as well, again, I have to put up a couple of maps of the groundwater system. This is the state's groundwater monitoring network that's keeping tabs on our shallow aquifers all across uh, South Dakota to make sure we know what's going on. Directed development is another way 
to maybe deal with things, and I sort of touched on this earlier. Um, if you have a, an operation that needs a lot of water, that particular location is probably not a good one, right? Anybody tell me where that is? Pardon? Bad water basin, lowest elevation in North America. That's Death Valley National Park. No water, okay? And if your facility needs water, that's a really bad place to do it. I don't care if you've already bought the land. Um, and so perhaps instead of building it here, maybe Chamberlain. It's a lovely town. You can get coffee for a nickel at Al's. Uh, and they have plenty of water. And I get that maybe you really wanted to live in Mitchell or Huron, but if you really needed water, maybe this is a better place to go. Uh, and so forth. Um, the good stuff's in the upper left-hand corner, little tasty blackened tilapia fillets. Uh, one example of this failure to plan I, I like to bring up every once in a while. I was contacted several years ago um, by folks who shall remain nameless, and they were asking about where they could find some water in a particular community. And so I pulled out some old maps and we had a little conversation and I said, well, this particular spot, you know, it's kind of sketchy. It's on the edge of where we thought a couple of aquifers might come together and, you know, you might find it, you might not, you might have to move around a little bit. And they're like, okay, all right, great, thanks. Six months later, I get a call. Hey, we, we, we drilled a hole at this spot and we didn't find anything. And I said, well, you know, that was kind of what we thought. You know, maybe if you move a mile or two to the west, it might help. And the guy goes, okay, how about if we move uh, 320 feet? Okay. And what's the rest of the, the rest of the story is that the facility was a tilapia, indoor tilapia breeding facility, these lovely little fish down here. And they had bought the land, they had put up the building, the big giant fish tank was in the ground when they discovered there was no water there. What's the one thing you need if you're going to raise fish? Okay. A little planning would help. Up in North Dakota, they've started a process that sort of leads to, uh, to this a little bit. Um, this is a map of the state. Uh, the color code is not necessarily important, but it's basically they've identified areas either over aquifers or along the Missouri River uh, where water is readily available or maybe problematic. So if you're looking for a resource and you haven't bought the building already, these are places they're telling you this, encouraging you to go, go here, not there. And we can certainly do some of that here in, in eastern South Dakota. I'm wrapping up. So we get Troy up here by showing some of Troy's stuff. <laughs> the Lewis and Clark Regional Water System, long distance transport. If you don't have it locally, you can't save it. You need to bring it in from somewhere else. And we've already reached that point in many instances in, in, in South Dakota. Uh, you look at long distance transport. And this is a, a quick sketch of Lewis and Clark. They have intakes uh, from wells along the Missouri River down south of Vermilion, a treatment plant and a series of very large pipes that either now are or shortly will be delivering water to a number of members all across the southeast part, or this part of the world. Um, a couple of quick tidbits. I've probably messed a few of these things up. But anyway, uh, initially capacity will be about 45 million gallons a day. Um, it can go to 60 in the future-ish. That's as big as the pipe can carry. So if you need 61, it doesn't matter. You can't force it through the pipe. Um, and uh, uh, it's really drawing very little off the river, so it's no big deal. Uh, 23 years in the making, Lewis and Clark finally delivered water, first delivered water to here to Sioux Falls in 2012. So there's 23 years. It's been another 10 years, so 30 some odd years. And Troy will probably tell us that they hope to be built out at the original design level in about two years time. It takes a long time to do this. And the sooner you start planning, the better off you're going to be. And so where are we headed? 
We're probably headed to big pipes. That's what it's going to all be about. There is no place we can save, no way we can recycle to keep the kind of growth that we need. And so we need to start thinking about big pipes. We needed to start thinking about it 25 years ago. The second best time is today. And with that, I have my little question slide here with the big giant rock. Again, anybody tell me where that big giant rock is? Largest erratic on the surface in the state of South Dakota, southwest of Flandreau. It's the Lone Rock. It's got its own church. It's got its own township. But anyway, uh, I'll hand it over to Troy, who's going to run from the big pipe level. Troy Larson has been the executive director of the Loop. <clears throat> excuse me, the Lewis and Clark Regional Water System for close to 20 years. Prior to that, he was a co congressional aide for 13 years in Sioux Falls, seven years for Larry, Senator Larry Pressler, and then six years as state director for then Congressman John Thute. He has a bachelor's degree in business administration from Mankato, Mankato State University and a master's degree from USD. Troy grew up on the farm near Groton, South Dakota, and has lived near Hartford, South Dakota since 1990. So. To summarize Jay's presentation, there's not enough groundwater, we need big pipe. And I'm here to talk about the big pipe. So why do we need more water? And I wanna share some examples quick. Uh, for those uh, who, who may th have thought Sioux Fall, or excuse me, that Lewis and Clark was the end all to the water needs of this area of the country, uh, sorry to pop your bubble, but no. Uh, more water is needed beyond uh, Lewis and Clark. I understand the city of Sioux Falls is in the process of doing a long-range water study to see how long uh, Lewis and Clark will hold. Uh, so we don't know if that's 20 years, 30 years, uh, but Sioux Falls needs more water. The vast majority of Lewis and Clark's 20 cities and rural water systems need more water beyond Lewis and Clark. Uh, Scott Buss, manager of MCWC, is here and they've reserved 2.2 million gallons a day from Lewis and Clark. They've long known that wasn't gonna be enough for them, so they and Big Sioux uh, Community Water System are joining together to uh, build a joint well field uh, treatment plant, and that will give MCWC an additional five million gallons of water. They haven't even turned dirt yet, and they have had enough inquiries that had they said yes to all of them, they already would have that five million gallons a day spoken for. And again, they haven't turned a shovel of dirt. And the reason it's five million, Scott told me, is that's, and that's their share, Big Sioux has a share as well, which is three million gallons a day. So eight million gallons total, the reason it's eight and not bigger is that's all the groundwater rights available from the Big Sioux Aquifer for Moody County. Uh, Minnehaha water rights, Big Sioux, are already spoken for. So there are no more. They would make it bigger if they could. We need more water. So I'm starting with the end in mind of why am I up here. I'm up here because we need another big pipe uh, coming from the Missouri River. And I need to though uh, start with some background to get to the big pipe. And so I'm gonna start with uh, Pick Sloan. And this is a presentation in part that I uh, heard back in October of 2021 from uh, uh, that was put together by Wade Bachmeyer, who is the Missouri River Joint Water Board Chair in North Dakota. And this really resonated with me, and about the same time, I got a call from Brad Lawrence, who many of you may know was with the city of Fort Pier, and then city of Madison, and, and is now with Bros Engineering, saying, you know, Troy, we need to be thinking about the next big pipe, uh, because, you know, the, the wave is coming, we need more water, and you need to start now. As Jay alluded to, it has taken it seemingly forever for Lewis and Clark to get where it is today, and we're not even done yet. And so we need to have already started on what's the next project. And so we believe we're already behind the eight ball in our efforts to uh, come up with the next regional water system. So I'll identify some of these slides again are from Wade's presentation, and then uh, there are uh, some from me. So first thing, uh, so Pick Sloan. Pick Sloan was the creation of the main stem dams along the Missouri River. And so what this presentation was focused on is what each state contributed to make those main stem dams possible, what was promised to each state in return, and what 
each state actually got. And probably not a surprise to you, what was promised and what was received are two different things, as is often the case. Before I get too far along, though, this is a, a really uh, poignant comment from Mark Reisner from this book, Cadillac Desert. In the West, water is the central fact of existence. In the East, to waste water is to consume it unnecessarily or excessively. In the West, to waste water is not to consume it, to let it flow unimpeded and undiverted down the river. And what you're going to be hearing is with regard to Pick Sloan, South Dakota is wasting a lot of water. We are letting a lot of water from the Missouri River flow by us that we should be tapping into. If we don't tap into it, you're going to have project or projects from Utah, California, Arizona, wherever they need water, whatever it costs, they're going to come get Missouri River water. So we need to quit, quit wasting water, and I'm not talking about leaving your faucet on, but we need to tap more into the Missouri River. So historic floods a number of years prompted Congress to act in terms of the main stem dams. Uh, Pick and Sloan were the last names of two individuals. One was the head of the Bureau of Reclamation, one was the head of the Corps of Engineers. They had competing plans, different interests, two different agencies. And they were forced by the president, FDR, to come together and meld those two plans. And so the focus then from Pick Sloan was water supply, irrigation, power generation, flood control, recreation, navigation, fish and wildlife. And here are the main stem dams that were created. The uh, one up in Montana, Fort Peck, was already in existence. As I recall, that was constructed in the 20s, but the rest of them were constructed as part of the uh, Pick Sloan project. South Dakota, we contributed about 30% of the land needed to construct the dams. And so a lot of land was flooded. Uh, we provide 15% uh, of the total flow, uh, which includes some water from Wyoming in terms of um, uh, down the main stem dams. And then we provide approximately 65% of the system's power. So here's where Wade present, and again, this is, these are all slides from Wade. Here's where he starts getting into the winners and losers of Pick Sloan. So average flood protection, one of the purposes of Pick Sloan was flood protection. South Dakota uh, is getting about uh, $41 million uh, a year in benefits in terms of flood control. And so we are one of the winners. South Dakota is one of the winners. You see he lists Missouri as the biggest winner. But South Dakota is one of the winners. Uh, power system benefits, South Dakota was promised 65% and, uh, excuse me, we are we're ge we're generating 65% of the power. We were promised 19.5% and we currently are getting about 2.7% of the power. So one of the big losers here is South Dakota with regard to power generation. System irrigation, a uh, big promise of Pick Sloan was irrigation for these uh, states and these are in acres of land not acre feet of water acres of land South Dakota was promised uh, Just under a million acres of irrigation and we have about 24,100 uh, acres of Irrigation so one of the big losers is South Dakota and I'll talk about why that is uh, There's a specific reason why we're coming out on such a short end of the stick with regard to irrigation Here's one of my slides so South Dakota was promised that much in irrigation. According to Ken Royce, who's up in North Dakota and is part of that Missouri River Joint Water Board, uh, South Dakota was promised an uh, in, in equivalent of six, 622 billion gallons of water a year. We're utilizing right now for irrigation about 15.4 billion gallons of water per year. So we're only using about 2.5% of what was promised under Pick Sloan. Back to some Ken slides. Water supply benefits. Uh, South Dakota is only 3% of all the intakes, so we're, we're not uh, coming out on the uh, good end of the stick there. So his, or, or excuse me, here's uh, recreation. Here's where we are doing well. South Dakota is 36% of all the benefits because of the dams, or excuse me, the lakes that were created uh, by the dams. So we're coming out good there. So here's the final conclusion from Wade, and this is the last slide. When it comes to Pick Sloan, Nebraska is the biggest winner. 
Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri, Kansas are winners. Losers are Colorado and Wyoming. And the big losers, not in a good way like on TV where they lose weight. Uh, Montana, North Dakota, and South Dakota are the big losers with regard to PIC Sloan. Rural water. So South Dakota was promised water through irrigation, as I mentioned. Uh, there was landowner opposition to the Oahe Irrigation Project that brought the canal to a standstill in the late 80s. It was defunded by President Carter. There were also other uh, irrigation projects on the drawing board that fell by the wayside. South Dakota then switched gears and worked to tap into the Missouri River for rural water projects. So the new incarnation of irrigation became rural water projects. Uh, in order to realize the promises of Pick Sloan. And Webb Water up in Aberdeen, or that, ap that area, was one of the first to tap into the Missouri River. For those of you who aren't old enough to remember the Oahe Irrigation Project, this is the part of the state that was supposed to have benefited from uh, the Oahe Irrigation Project. So rural water, we currently have 11 rural water systems that are drawing a combined 19 billion gallons per year from the Missouri River or an adjacent aquifer. For example, Lewis and Clark doesn't pull directly out of the river, we pull out of an aquifer adjacent to the river. This does not include systems that are then in turn buying water for, from some of these systems. In total, with irrigation and rural water, we're using about 34 billion gallons a year. That represents about 5.5% of what was promised to South Dakota from PIC Sloan. So we have roughly 1.6 billion gallons a year that remain uh, from PIC Sloan. So this is, the reason I'm sharing this is this is where we get to the big pipe, eventually. So uh, this uh, came from a report, and I see Tim Cowman here, uh, Tim, back in 1989, was co-author of this study that showed that 17.2 billion gallons a day were cruising by Yankton, uh, and I understand that number is maybe down a little, but not too much, so it's, for comparison purposes, let's assume it's about the same. Uh, it is impossible for South Dakota to utilize 1.6 billion gallons a day. If a new regional water system were developed that hypothetically equaled 120 million gallons a day, which is twice what Lewis and Clark is designed for, that still represents seven-tenths of one percent of the average flow. So the point being is everyone agrees there's enough capacity in the Missouri River to address South Dakota's water needs. Now that doesn't mean the downstream states won't argue, but this will be our comeback. We will say, no, pick Sloan, uh, we were promised this, and so there is no fear of draining the Missouri River, I guess is what I'm saying, in order to meet South Dakota's needs. I'm going to go over this fairly quickly, but what we're doing in South Dakota is trying to replicate what North Dakota has done. North Dakota is about 10, 15 years ahead of us, which is the first time I've ever said that about North Dakota, but they are ahead of us, and we are trying to catch up, and they have been very helpful in providing advice, counsel, and so I want to thank uh, our friends up in North Dakota. So in North Dakota, they were promised this, all these uh, acres of irrigation, and in a nutshell, what this slide and the next one is, is they've converted, they've traded in their, ir their irrigation acres for dollars that they are using for what's called MRNI, municipal, residential, and industrial water uses. So at various times, in 65, in 84, in 2000, they essentially said, okay, federal government, we will give up our irrigation rights, if you will, and cash those chips in for dollars that we can use for rural water projects. Those funds are nearly spent. Uh, they have another 200 million that they're arguing about for the Red, Ra Red River Valley Water Project. Um, they also got some money for fish and wildlife interests. So that is the model they have followed, and we look to replicate that in terms of, hey, uh, we're not going to use this, these uh, acres for irrigation. Uh, let's uh, try to develop uh, more water systems. 
Here's what North Dakota is doing. They're taking more of a regionalization approach than we have. So these are four very large regional water systems. So Lewis and Clark is a regional water system uh, on a smaller scale than these. Uh, and so the, anyway, this is what uh, North Dakota is doing. So what's the next regional water system? There's a project called Water Investment in Northeast South Dakota. It uses the acronym WINS. Uh, that involves Web Rural Water, BDM Rural Water in the city of Aberdeen. So the north part of eastern South Dakota is being covered. Uh, there's also a project called Western Dakota Regional Water System that's on the drawing board, and that's all of Western South Dakota. Again, all of Western South Dakota. So we have a gap in the central and southern part of Eastern South Dakota, and the handwriting is on the wall that we need to start now. Long-term solution is another pipeline or pipelines from the Missouri River. We have to conserve. Absolutely we have to conserve, but conserving is not the answer. That will not solve our long-term water needs, but we can't ignore it. It will buy us time. We also need to identify pockets of groundwater that can be utilized, so maybe not all areas need to be uh, covered by this next uh, regional water system. Uh, water 2040 is the name that's been given to the effort to create the next regional water system. Uh, it, we have a steering committee. Uh, Jay Gilbertson is on that steering committee. Mark Cotter with the city of Sioux Falls is also on it. Uh, Kurt Feifley, who's the head of South Dakota Association of Rural Water Systems. Myself, uh, Brad Lawrence, a few others. And we recently met with uh, DANR Secretary Hunter Roberts and other officials uh, on November 9th. Uh, we are working with them on what are the next steps, what's the state's role. Uh, the state, the geological survey, played a critical role in a study in 1989. Again, Tim Kalman was co or one of the authors of that, uh, that resulted in Lewis and Clark. That study resulted in Lewis and Clark, because they recommended well, the only solution you have is a big pipe, and that became Lewis and Clark. So Tim, before you retire, we got to have another report saying we need a big pipe, all right? Next step is to identify possible service area for them to study who needs more water, bless you, and when uh, resources will be needed to undertake such an endeavor. And so that's what we're working with the state uh, in terms of uh, resources to start organizing, to get out there, who uh, studies, uh, who, who needs more water and when. Uh, I'm going to skip this because hot off the press today, first time ever, is this new map. Just got it this morning. Thank you, Troy, for working this in so quickly. This is conceptually what we're talking about with regard to water 2040. So you'll see in the north part of eastern South Dakota, that's the winds area. That's web water, uh, BDM real water in the city of Aberdeen. They want to bring a big pipe over from the Missouri River and serve that area. Everything west of the river is western Dakota regional water system. So we have this gap then again in the central and eastern part, excuse me, central and southern part of eastern South Dakota. The working idea, this is conceptual, the working idea is treated water pipelines, not raw water, treated water pipelines that we branch out and then cities and rural water systems as needed come to those pipelines. So think of these as a depot. Here's the line, you come to us, get your water. Uh, uh, Brad Lawrence has suggested to start, we, we look at Lake Sharp uh, uh, behind the Big Bend Dam at Fort Thompson. And you'll see we, what we try to do is cut through and contact as many of these um, rural water systems as possible so that we leave no rural water system behind. And there's a spur coming down Sioux Falls simply because Sioux Falls is going to need a lot of water. This will change many times, but I want to share with you just to give you a conceptual idea of what we're talking about. <clears throat> 